I'm excited to introduce our esteemed panel here, uh, Mr. Utso Pradhanji, social entrepreneur, environment activist, founder, TD Forest Garden. So please, please join us on the stage. Kushong village, nestled in the eastern Himalayas of Darjeeling. His childhood memories resonate with the embrace of mother nature, foresting and enduring bond with the mountains. Right, like we do have some memories of our childhood and he has an esteemed memory with the mother nature. While his professional journey traversed various cities across India, he culminated his corporate tenure as the national product head of Next Education India Private Limited, an education tech startup. So you can take a seat. <laughs> Fueled by his love for mountains, Mr. Ustavji ventured into mountaineering and trekking across the Himalayas. It was during one of his soul-searching trips that he stumbled upon the profound philosophy of permaculture in a remote northern Himalayan form. This encounter became a turning point, right? <laughs> became a turning point, connecting with the threats of regenerative living, climate action, community development, and the pivotal harmony with the nature. Under the guidance of Riku Zuk, he's completed his permaculture design certificate and established TD Forest Garden in 2016. TD stands as a beacon of climate action in the Darjeeling Hills, championing initiatives in zero waste, uh, responsible tourism, and experiential environmental education. Its core mission revolves around advocating sustainable living. I'll read. Sustainable living by confronting waste as its source. Right? Additionally, it operates as an ecological training center focusing on permaculture, regenerative tourism, natural farming, and sustainable land and building design consultation. Functioning as a registered NGO, TD spearheads experimental environmental, environmental education and comprehensive waste management projects, emphasizing community-driven solutions for the plastic reduction and awareness. Utsav's leadership initiated the Save 8 Mile Cola in 2017, a community-driven endeavor that transformed three hamlets into zero waste village by educating residents on waste segregation and composite. What a great achievement. I mean, three hamlets. We still at home are struggling uh, sorting our dry waste and uh, wet waste. And here, yeah, this impact on uh, three villages. By that is again, like yesterday, Navin Paul sir said, it's education, education, education. And I think that was the key here. The, how the three villages got transformed into zero waste village. That is through educating and learning from the residents itself, right? For the past five years, TD collaborated with five schools in the Kersang and Darjeeling, providing experiential environmental education. These efforts empower students in composting techniques, local species identification, and cultivating their own sustenance. Right? A remarkable community-driven effort transformed a 1.8-acre dumping ground into a thriving permaculture garden within eight years. Utsav's unwearing dedication earned him recognition as a local environmental champion by scavengers Darjeeling in 2019 and by young Indians Silguri in 2022. So without any ado, let's give a warm round of applause for our speaker here today. And the stage is all yours. It's an honor, uh, actually a very humbling honor to be here amongst all of you. And uh, uh, it's actually for me, when you look at it, uh, life coming to a full circle because um, I was a Hyderabadi for almost 11 years of my life. I lived in Hyderabad. Okay. <laughs> And I retain some of the uh, language still, Nipero NT, Koncham Koncham. But uh, yeah, why I call it a full circle is because while I was in Hyderabad, um, I had no clue about permaculture, I had no clue about uh, sustainable living. It was only once uh, I left Hyderabad and embarked uh, on a journey. Um, and while uh, backpacking in uh, Uttarakhand is when um, I chanced upon uh, this farm called the Himalayan Farm Project and I volunteered there for some time, um, bounced across the idea of permaculture, was introduced to it and uh, I realized it resonated very well with some things that I'd already subscribed in my head but uh, permaculture was like uh, the thread that connected it all. 
So after that, I um, moved back to Darjeeling and uh, got into, uh, you can say, a journey into rediscovering my roots and also a little bit of uh, our shamanic roots. Okay, so um, we folks from the mountains are, uh, you know, have been worshipping nature actually for a very, very long time. And uh, shamanism uh, was something that connected us to uh, the natural world. And uh, while trying to discover shamanism is when I hit upon some of these practices. All right, so uh, rather than a talk, uh, I would prefer if this becomes like an exchange and uh, uh, this becomes more like um, a storytelling session, right? And so I have um, divided this into um, a two-part storytelling. Okay, one would be about uh, the journey of TD and uh, which would be shorter. And the second part would be about uh, our uh, zero waste initiative, what we call uh, zero waste Andalan. Okay, and uh, interweaved in this, there are also three side stories. Where um, I was picking the brain till about like midnight, sitting in the municipality office, trying to understand how things work. And you know, so uh, yeah, Kerala, so the commies and uh, their way of, implementing certain things, you get to learn a lot. So interestingly, uh, there was something that I like picked up from there, okay, was uh, uh, the fact that the problem is so huge that you have to make it like a revolution. Again, okay, trust the commies to come up with that idea, right? So, <laughs> so what they did was, now you have to convince people, but no matter how much you do, people don't get convinced, right? And in India, waste is pretty interesting because it's not just, it interweaves the caste hierarchy, right? So, um, and when we want people to kind of do some practice, they may listen to some of us going there and talking, but when it's implemented on a day-to-day -day basis, they actually look down, unfortunately, upon our dear waste workers, okay? They don't want to, they just slam the door on their faces when someone says, ab kachra please segregate karlo okay so they overcame the this in a very interesting way where they said they had something called a 10000 strong green army okay so what they did was they enrolled students college students and those college students um, were assigned households after the municipality passed a law saying that there's not going to be any day to day waste collection everyone has to mandatorily compost at home okay and then if it's your driveways to keep it once in a week, we'll give you numbers and they enrolled uh, private partners and then they were supposed to call that number. So it's cloth day, you someone goes and collects the cloth. It's plastic day, someone. So there is no waste that you can dump outside now. And next time there is uh, your doorbell rings and the, you, uh, you know, someone from the municipality comes and instead of the waste worker, so this time there's a, a student with a tie and you know, who can speak to you in fluent English and also in your local language and he says, can I have a look at your waste? You know? So this time the door opens and he's given a cup of tea. You know, Like I said, trust the companies to come up with this brilliant idea. <laughs> and it worked out really, really well. And I uh, kind of uh, also understood like, you know, some techniques about uh, community composting, home composting, happened to go down to Bangalore also, uh, met up with Poonam from Daily Dump and uh, we signed an IP so that I could uh, create uh, build some khambas in Darjeeling. And uh, so I went back a little pacified, saying that, okay, maybe something can be done. So we started um, our journey of managing the biodegradable waste of our community. And uh, again, a lot of credit to uh, volunteers who came by, because um, uh, those were days when every day, we're still doing it, it's been seven years, every day we go to the community, carry all the biodegradable waste, get it to a composting unit and uh, compost it. We learned it the hard way as to how to compost because initially, uh, you know, when I looked around for a composting unit in Darjeeling, there was none. You know, imagine the entire district, not even one composting unit that is there, a community composting unit. So we had to innovate and uh, figure out the technique of doing it in low temperatures when temperature sometimes even goes to minus. So uh, we came up with uh, different kinds of design and Finally, what worked for us was uh, to have some composting warriors inside the composting unit. So we involved chickens. 
Okay, so we have the chicken coop that's uh, together with the composting unit. And we also realized that, uh, you know, for so long, like uh, we know now that we've been doing it wrong. Like the farming is one of the core problems of the climate crisis that is there, right? For 10,000 years, we have been doing it wrong to cut down trees and to plant crops. Right? We, instead of practicing natural farming practices. So even for chickens, we've been doing wrong in cooping them. You know, we call it chicken coop, but they hate to be co cooped. That's what we realize. They're birds and they like to be perched up. If, they leave them, if you leave them around, they like to be on the branches. So we, again, uh, permaculture came to the rescue, you know, what they call a protracted observation. So uh, what we did is just over the composting unit, we created a bar, okay? And we realized that at night, all of those uh, chicks that we have would go and perch themselves up, and that's where they sleep. And every time they sleep, they go, pitch, pitch. Okay, and all of that becomes your catalyst to ensure that even at colder cli climates, you are able to compost effectively. So every day, I think for the past seven years now, we've been composting close to 200 kgs per day. And uh, we worked on the design and then we realized, again, it was great to have Saurabh then, okay, and we realized maybe we can do it in some other place, you know, maybe it's just, uh, like, like I said, TD has the shamanic energy, maybe it's happening because of that, should we try it outside? So first we tried it with the monastery and uh, we designed it there and it worked. Then we tried it with another school, it worked. So now that community composting unit is there in about uh, 10 different uh, uh, enterprises outside, right from um, uh, restaurants. Okay. And, um, you know, so this interconnection works out really well. So when uh, we did uh, one of the uh, permaculture courses and uh, Divya was around that time and we happened to talk and just then there was a restaurant that was keen on going on a zero waste journey. So she helped us design uh, the composting unit, MRF and a garden. And uh, we implemented that and this, the restaurant has been zero waste for the past two years now. So uh, we solved the problem with regards to how to community compost. Now home composting also uh, was a very interesting journey. Uh, we created those khambas and of course, uh, 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 you know, uh, the other using um, upcycled buckets, those plastic buckets also. And, um, but again, the, the challenge in places like ours was when the temperature is not there, how do you compose, how do you introduce microbes? So um, we did something interesting where uh, they, and also, uh, you know, when we tell people, all you need is dry leaves, you know, just go crush some dry leaves and add, that's the carbon component or just add some. So they don't want to kind of go through all of that. So they wanted something that is very, you know, um, made into like a commodity that they can just put the waste and sprinkle something, you know, as easy as that, you know, like that ad that used to be there, that fill it, shut it, forget it, you know. So this is, we had to come up with something similar for the composting unit. So we came up with something called a catalyst, where uh, it is a combination of sawdust um, and uh, uh, hood ash. And also we added um, some of the natural herbs that we have. And for the microbes, what we did was uh, we harvested the IMOs, what we call indigenous microorganisms from the forest. And, uh, and these guys are extremely powerful, right? The indigenous microorganisms and we fed them jaggery. Okay, so there is this whole process where you kind of multiply them. So when you feed them jaggery, they kind of explode into millions. And then you kind of make it into a form that it's pulse. So just in like maybe a 25 kg sack, you just add like one spoonful for it. And it goes now into every home. So, and uh, what we did was we started creating stories for people so that they really believe in us. So what we told them that in the forest, there are the forest soldiers or what you call the Spartans. And those Spartans now are very hungry. Okay, they're coming to your home. As soon as you sprinkle, they'll eat away all your wastes. Okay, and we told them the way to uh, realize that is slowly your composting unit start getting fungus. Okay, so it's like getting the mycelium fungi and also it'll start spreading into your home, just the composting unit and they'll eat. And it's worked out. So right now, over, I would say, 350 households in both uh, Sikkim and Darjeeling Himalayas are using a home composting unit. So, uh, 
you know, talking about looking looking back and you know connecting the dots, it seems like oh, it's easy peasy. But uh, yeah, we went through the struggle. But the real challenge was how do you manage the non-biodegradable waste, right? Because it's a lot of fun working with uh, soil, okay, and the scientific background also some of us know, right? When you work with soil, you know, and even while composting, there is this. Uh, uh, a good bacteria that gets released, it's called MacVacay, kind of, and when you work a lot with it, you realize that uh, it releases serotonin, you know, and makes you calmer. And that's when I ask people that, has anyone here come across an angry gardener? <laughs> will tell you, give me the seeds! <laughs> right, so, all the gardeners that I've seen are so calm, you know, as if, like, nothing is troubling them. And it's scientific. What has happened is the microbes are going inside them, okay, and keeping them happy. So we were like, you know, for a while, when we just focused on the biodegradable waste, uh, things were good. So one day we decided that uh, let's take up the non-biodegradable waste of the community. Let's see what happens, okay, let's start segregating it. And um, what's good is a couple of folks who are part of this journey are still here, Abhishek Ji, yeah, yeah. and Saurav, they were volunteering that time. And uh, do you guys remember those days where we used to collect it? Okay, now imagine going and collecting the entire biodegradable, of course, non -biodegra uh, biodegradable composting, non biodegradable waste, getting it. And we said, okay, guys, let's come together, let's segregate it for at least a couple of hours. Okay, so we were sitting in like a circle, and okay, plastic nickel, MLP, okay, toothbrush, uh, oh, okay, there is a sanitary pad, okay, keep it outside. Oh, there is a condom, okay, keep it aside. Oh, there is something, oh, you know, so you kind of segregate all of that. Now, interestingly, what has happened is we look at each other and we're getting angry. You know, so serotonin is gone. Okay, so some other thing is getting released and it's making you very, very angry. You know, you're trying to really, it's almost like an existential crisis saying that, why? Why do we have to do this? And we were, we had come up with 35 categories like cigarette butts, alakse. Okay, plastic also, colored plastic, white plastic, okay, hard plastic, HDP, LDP. And the moment you do it yourself, get your hands dirty, is when you realize that the plight of our folks who've been working in this industry. You know, and that's when you realize, like I said, you'll never come across an uh, angry gardener, you'll never come across a healthy waste worker. You know, there is their life expectancy would not exceed probably in India about 45. Uh, if you guys want to kind of go deep inside and understand what the waste industry is like in India, uh, check out this book called Waste of a Nation by uh, this uh, author called Doron. Okay, it's a, it's a brilliantly researched book and that goes deep inside all kinds of waste that we see in India. So uh, we realized it's going to be extremely difficult to tackle that kind of a uh, waste that is there and also how do we keep people motivated right so some are volunteering so how long can you volunteer for that and how long can you uh, do that particular thing and how much salary can you pay for someone to do that on a regular basis right? and this is something that is important to ask and uh, seek answers for because it cannot be as such that okay we create policies and we say that, okay, there is this category of people who will work on this and let them do it, right? It's wrong. If it's something that we set as a process, it should be something that I should be able to do it, okay? And not just say that certain caste of people or certain religion people should be able to do it. So again, another level of soul searching went into it. And uh, we decided to kind of uh, understand how, uh, you know, the non-biodegradable waste uh, is tackled. And it kind of dampened our morale and also then we realized that we start, we were stuttering basically and uh, we realized that um, uh, it needs further support whatever that we are doing. So um, and it needed to be like a tripod, right? So three legs supports it well. So one leg we would figured it out like a grassroots community movement. Now for the other two legs, uh, I'll come to that as to what uh, were the missing legs and we had no idea about that then. So uh, here I'd like to tell one of the side stories, okay, uh, which is about Bhalu. Okay, Bhalu means a bear and uh, 
What happened was when we started composting and when we started rewilding, uh, we started attracting, um, of course, the wild animals, right? So we had the uh, Himalayan salamander popping up, sometimes the wild boar, deer, you know. So one day we saw the composting unit had been ripped open. Okay. And uh, we were like, okay, could the boar do it? But it looked like someone just pulling the whole thing apart and then going inside and, you know, shuffling it through. And then we were like, then someone said, okay, look at the tree behind it. There's a pine tree and there were like scratches like out there. Then you go, oh, you got an interesting visitor last night. So um, now anyone who's like done community composting at um, a limited, um, you know, area would know that you have to turn it, right? If you don't have an option to just leave it like that. Because you, your same space is getting utilized for 200 kgs per day, right? We're just talking about 100 square feet area and 200 kgs per day. That means you have to turn and aerate it. And that's quite a task, okay? And people who've jumped into the composting unit and done it realize that when you do it, the smell won't go off for about two days. <laughs> so uh, uh, what we did was we decided to open up the part where the bhalu was going inside. And we were like, okay, if you want to come, let's come, okay? Like integrate, don't segregate. So we created a, a blank, uh, sort of like a chadar or a blanket, so that next time he comes, okay, he does not have to rip everything apart. He just sticks it up, goes inside, and does the turning for us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is the fifth year coming. Okay, he's been coming. <laughs> so, huh? Sorry. Oh yeah, last year we had his kid, yeah, coming now. <laughs> so this is like the fifth year um, running that he's coming. And uh, we shifted the composting unit uh, next to the road. So yeah, uh, he's still coming there. And <laughs> so yeah, it's inter in interesting how it works. And he does not trouble anyone else. You know, what's interesting is um, one day uh, when we checked, um, we saw the Bhalu, okay, doing his work, he's eaten, he's composted, and he's sitting down like that, okay. And there is, on the other side, the chicken who is sitting on the egg, and both are looking at each other. <laughs> and he's done no harm. And what's also worked for us is the fact that uh, twice we had an attack by the yellow-throated marten. Ferocious, looks like a small squirrel, but they wipe out the entire herd of chicks, if you have, okay. And Twice, we had the entire herd of about 25 chickens wiped out because of... Once the Balu started coming, I don't know what it is. Okay, those guys stay away. So the Balu has become the protector of the chickens and he's uh, doing a lot of unpaid work for us. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was one of the side stories. And while we were uh, working on uh, like the non-biodegradable waste, uh, we're trying to figure out and then uh, we also uh, realized that there is another category of waste that uh, some of us don't realize, which is the liquid waste. Right? And uh, again, in the name of development, uh, something that we've gone wrong is the way that we poop and pee. And uh, if you look at any apartment that you go to see, you'll never find a, a squatting toilet anymore. Okay, they'll say that, oh, this is like, Purane Jamanika or, you know, this is only for the poor people. So you need Western toilet, you know, all those are. But when you look at it, it's absolutely stupid. You know, absolutely stupid because uh, amount of water that gets, that you utilize to flush down something, okay, as opposed to an Indian toilet is immense. And also the fact that uh, anyone who's used it, okay, would realize that it does not flush with one go. <laughs> Right? You have to wait, or the person is knocking outside, you know, and you like, oh, till the flush tank fills up, and then you have to flush it again, hoping that this time it would go. And every time you do that, you're using almost 20 liters of water, you know. And in a place where there is water scarcity, okay, it's, it's sacrilegious to actually do that. And uh, also the fact that it's not great for our body to be pooping that way. And uh, the fact that you are taking one extremely valuable resource, okay, water, and flushing down another extremely valuable resource, which is poop. So we decided to kind of also experiment on that. Okay, so we decided to kind of build a human over tank 
where and we also decided to kind of uh, experiment using small compost toilets and uh, uh, we call this toilets now okay Preeti who's uh, also another architect who is right now with us we designed something called a lovable loo okay. and with the tagline saying that we are trying to redefine how you poop and pee okay so what we did was uh, we separated the pooping center and the peeing center and then your pee goes down gets collected in tank gets mixed with water it's channelized into a forest okay so it gets free urea and also uh, what we did is uh, the poop there is a instead of water you why can't we flush with something dry you know or with something that has got microbes that can immediately start acting on decomposing it and uh, we kind of again uh, kind of curated the design on our own because if you look at all the if you follow like oh, the bible of poop the human over handbook they say okay no water okay but we allowed water to be used because you wanted it to be accessible so we have like um uh, what we call um bum pichkari you know <laughs> so we allowed that okay so that's just about 100 ml of water okay and it's it's okay because we're adding a lot of carbon anyways right so that goes down and uh, that starts getting composted so uh, when we started working on this we found that you know something interesting is also happening and uh, we did a project so that site story 2 with uh, a school my own alma mater and uh, where during lockdown uh, there were no students there and uh, the principal had called me to talk about building a composting unit which we did and uh, an mrf uh, materials recovery facility to manage the dry waste which we did and then while we were walking on the ground uh, this is a bare barren ground uh, that has been barren for about 70 years okay so we um, happened to talk and you say uh, so brother samuel that's his name he said so i'm thinking of putting an astro turf here you know so anyone like you know working on this background like no because one amount of microplastic that it releases and uh, it's not great for uh, the students also in terms of um, their own health because uh, and if you realize it's come in prominence but if you realize none of the world cups are played in natural grass none of the football leagues are played in it's all on natural grass so then i said um, okay you don't have the kids here can we experiment so he said okay, how much time do you need so we took Uh, a month and we take we took about 100 square feet area and we said okay let's see if you are able to grass this naturally will you allow us to grass the whole football field and he said okay no kids are here i mean it's a lockdown so go ahead so uh, a credit to again two uh, folks who were part of this project saurav and abhishek okay one is a permaculture architect permaculture engineer <laughs> we went into a project of trying to grass a place that had been barren for 70 years and uh, what was interesting is uh, now imagine this place does not have any microbial life right so we had to introduce so all of the human ore that we had collected without telling the principal we spread it okay cover it with a lot of leaves okay. and uh, then now we needed a lot of urea okay if you search uh, google source of urea the first thing that will come up is human urine okay urea urine okay then you connect the dots then um, what we built was in middle of the field we created something called a pea pod okay and it was interesting for me to go to my school principal and say brother can you please go and do it for me? <laughs> <laughs> and it is a pea pod that kept moving okay and kept moving different places and all you did after your pea is like there is a sack of wood shaving just spread it okay no smell whatsoever and uh, what was also interesting is because there were some workers who were stationed in the school even though it was work lock locked down and then they were working there we tried an experiment where we said um, please go and pee there okay we'll pay you money <laughs> okay now in the hills um, we don't drink water because pyasi nahi lagti right we don't perspire and that's why people have a lot of health problems okay so uh, we realize now that because we are paying money people are drinking a lot of water <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and after like a month of the project i realized that the workers are becoming fairer okay <laughs> the complexion is changing and so it has like a, a social impact also and uh, four months down the line uh, and now it's like uh, i think three years down the line it's a green grass football field where children play wow, it's very beautiful yeah
with fair people. <laughs> so that's another side story of how much we don't realize the value of like our own waste that is there. And uh, so while we were that working with the whole waste thing, we question arose uh, saying that why do we even have to manage it? You know, why does waste have to be managed? So it's again a question that came up, and uh, it's like while you're trying to clean up, you realize that there is this whole wave of uh, consumerism that is there that is sweeping everything across. No matter how much you clean up or no matter how much you do, it's wrong. Okay, because uh, in case of waste, there is no such thing as away, right? Either here or there, it's just one home that we have. Okay, and uh, that's why I love, you know, asking these questions to children. There was once a uh, session that I was doing for, you know, a, like about 300 uh, kids were there and I put it across, like, what do we do? You know, and they brainstormed and uh, they came up with a solution and they said, let's build a rocket and let's send all the waste to outer space. <laughs> You know, only they could think that much out of the box. So, uh, what? So it, it was like a, a problem that again you don't have an answer for, right? So, uh, because anyone who has worked in waste realized that um, recycling, there's no such thing as recycling. Okay, we are made fools by the big giants thinking that your water bottle gets recycled, plastic gets recycled, plastic does not get recycled. Even if nine percent is reaching those recycled so-called recycling centers. What is happening to plastic? It, it is getting downcycled. The bottle will not come back as a bottle. It will come back as some fiber with which you make t-shirts. After some time, you can't do anything with it. Okay, so plastic at best can just be downcycled. There's no such thing as recycling. So, however, there is something called upcycling. You know? And that is something that, um, if done well, can be a creative exercise that will make you feel good about the work that you're doing. So, um, we connected that particular dot, but again, we did not know how to kind of take it forward. And uh, we also realized that people, you know, are not given alternatives. So that's when uh, we came up with the concept of an eco store. And uh, we just started giving people alternatives saying that, you know, just start doing it. Because watching that particular toothbrush come into the land and staying there 400 years and then, you know, being the cause of the you know, landslide and realizing that people don't have uh, options, we just started getting those uh, options to people and be it like a, a bamboo toothbrush or uh, let's say even things like uh, a travel mug, a collapsible travel mug and we had about 160 items that people could just opt for and the TD Eco store is still there where uh, people can opt for things that's uh, a little regenerative rather than something that is harming the ecology around. And uh, we also realized that uh, we had to come up with a framework, okay, and uh, uh, again, taking inspiration from our uh, commie friends, we realized it has to be an andolan. Okay, that's when we came up with a term called zero waste andolan, and we started uh, taking everything under this particular umbrella. And we started uh, training, again, a batch of students uh, whom we call biruas or saplings in our language who are extensively trained from uh, by us. And then they would be the ones helping us execute the projects outside. And uh, we came up with this framework for our village called uh, a zero waste village. Okay. Now, a lot of people uh, have this question saying, how can it be a zero waste village? You know, waste will always get generated, right? So for us, uh, Zero Waste Village, we defined it saying that it's a village that does not burn, that does not dump its waste. Okay, and is constantly looking out for alternatives to turn off the tap. Okay, like for instance, if there is a, a wedding happening in the village, no one would be using those water bottles or, you know, those disposable plastic. They would be looking at reusables. If there is a, another event that's happening, you are not trying to generate waste in the first place. So, of course, no burn, no dump. So, that's when we stepped in. And we decided to kind of collect all the waste, get it to TD, and start processing it, and uh, ensuring that there is door-to-door -door collection, uh, despite the fact that there wasn't any uh, presence from uh, the government side. Because unfortunately, in da Darjeeling, we've gone through a very, uh, you know, uh, a tumultuous uh, political history. So 
after almost 20 years is when we had our first panchayat elections recently, about a couple of months back. So there was absolutely no presence on the waste management sector then. So uh, we started working with one village called Rajata, we made it zero waste. Then we started working with another village called Naya Basti, we made it zero waste. They, they have the zero waste framework right inside uh, when you start entering the village. And uh, we realized that, uh, and yeah, this got a lot of, uh, you know, footage, like the Nanjio guys came and they kind of shot it. There was uh, another lady who came, they, she also did a video about it. And it's it kind of uh, inspired a lot of people to try and work out something similar in their villages also. And uh, we realized that the air is fresher. Okay, you can immediately realize when no one's burning plastic around you, you know that the air is fresher. And uh, we were able to uh, then realize the value of pure air and fresh water and rich soil. And that's when we also uh, gave it the vision of TED, which is uh, pure air, fresh water, rich soil for all beings. Not just for us, but for all beings. And with this framework, um, we also started uh, implementing it in um, other places outside. And uh, so that's like side story number three. So what happened was, uh, uh, when I was in Hyderabad, I discovered this joy of running. Okay, so there's this group in Hyderabad called Hyderabad Runners. So I used to run with them. And did my first uh, marathon with them. And uh, when I went back home also, I started uh, running with some of the folks then. And, you know, so running is a beautiful sport, helps you connect with um, a lot of people. And, you know, you discover, uh, places and I have a look at it in a new way and uh, during one of those uh, runs is when um, like I said you meet a lot of interesting people right so there was this beautiful lady okay very fit and who was running along and we happened to talk okay and um, we were running along okay quite enjoying the conversation and uh, of course uh, the organizers had kept water bottles plastic water bottles and then they were taking the water bottles and she takes the water bottle extremely like I said very fit very good looking lady and she runs she runs and she drinks water and running alongside her she takes it and chucks it down the hill <laughs> <laughs> the beauty became the beast and I stopped I said please carry on I'm like you know how can you do that and I realize that, yeah, people are not conscious, but it's also like um, organizers who have to be a little mindful. And people just think, you know, that runners here, they can't stop for a little while because they need to be in the movement. So they need something light to carry and which is how stupid. We've been runners for millions of years and someone says, now we can't run unless you've got a plastic water bottle in your hand. You know, so we decided to challenge that. Uh, but that was like after uh, I had given up running an event. So I stopped participating in any of the events. And uh, one day, I just had enough of this because such a beautiful sport, it's just getting or creating such a terrible mess, mess. I mean, anyone who's seen a running event in the city would know, just go and see, like after the event, you know, the pile of waste that is there. Again, it's not great to see it getting cleared because it has to go somewhere, right? Somewhere it is getting burned or somewhere it's getting dumped into a landfill. So we sent a cold email to uh, one of the organizers in Darjeeling saying that you are doing, a, and it was the Darjeeling police, okay? And they uh, organized one of the biggest runs in Darjeeling. We sent a cold email saying that, okay, doing a Darjeeling, uh, they call it the Darjeeling police marathon. We have people from all over the country. Milin Suman had come as one of the ambassadors and you know, 2,000, 3,000 runners. And we sent a cold email saying that, allow us to be a zero waste partner. Okay, and uh, we went there and we kind of, for about, you know, they didn't answer three days before. Okay, and as it works with the police, they call us, okay, come, come, sit down, let's do it. Okay, three days before the event. And uh, yeah, one mind was to tell them, no, it doesn't work out this way. It's actually the design that you have to be uh, involving us. So, but we said, okay, we, let's, let's try and give it a shot. But again, uh, uh, the universe conspired for us. We just did a volunteering shout out. There were 100 volunteers who registered for it to come on board as a zero waste officer. And uh, we did an experiment where, like I said, police organizing it. So 
those hundred volunteers, what we did was we created a sash, okay, on uh, with a darker print, which is like you can immediately know that it's from the hills, and we created a big badge for them, okay, that said a zero waste officer. Okay, now they're standing alongside a police officer, and they're also a zero waste officer, <laughs> and hundreds of them. So uh, what we did was we replaced the plastic water bottles with uh, steel glasses. And again, for them, we're like, where do we get it? Okay, so we went and bought 600 glasses and we spread it across. And now uh, we realized that once this thing picks up, uh, there would be others who want to do it. So after that, we've started uh, doing these zero waste marathons where we come on board as a partner and we've done about nine zero waste marathons in the hills. And all of those steel uh, tumblers that we have, okay, we've created our own uh, Burton Bank, taking inspiration from the Darshana, who's got a Burton Bank in Hyderabad. <laughs> so, and um, the, I really wanted to come, you know, earlier, attend all the three days of the session, but I couldn't because um, we uh, were uh, trying out something interesting because um, Rimba had said that after some time, after the villagers also started asking, saying that, okay, we are a zero waste village, we are breathing pure air, we are drinking like good water, okay, we can grow our food, but so what? You know? And that shocked me initially. You're like, but you have everything. But it's easier for us to say that we've seen the other side than to convince the villagers who haven't seen the other side. Their aspirations are completely different. So then we realized that we had to kind of take in the feedback. Okay, apply it and reinvent ourselves. So that's when we realized that we had to work upon two things. One is uh, livelihood generation and also work out a way in which we are able to um, reverse the strength of ghost villages. Okay, in the mountains, I've noticed not just here, but even in places like Uttarakhand, people are actually leaving their villages. You might see some crowd there. Okay, some tourist crowd. It is just some entrepreneur who set up some huts here and there. Of course, a lot of people come in from outside, you know, they have a good time. But there is no social fabric in the villages anymore. People are just abandoning those villages because they are not happy. They don't have anything good that they can look forward to out there. So, uh, uh, we decided to experiment with doing something in a village and connecting something that has been our strength, zero waste, hosting events, marathons. And we came up with a concept which was very new. We called it the Darjeeling Eco Trail Run, okay, which just happened on uh, the 18th. So in that run, what we did was we involved villagers and we told them that the run will happen in the village, it will pass through the village. okay, And uh, because we had the network of runners, a lot of them uh, came and supported us. There were about 100 runners and they are running up the village, you know. So it's like a steep terrain. And some of them, I realized, were crawling up. <laughs> and uh, of course, but we call it the a trail that will give you, uh, it's wicked, but it's enchanting too. Because once you climb up the view, you'll forget all the pain. But climbing up is, yeah, really, really difficult. And we wanted to kind of also inspire the village youth to see whether they can also start taking up running as a sport, because that will also help them uh, you know, mentally, because a lot of those guys are actually like even in that zero waste village that I talked about in the past six years, there's been about seven suicides. So people are actually struggling uh, with their emotional well-being in the villages. Uh, so I was expecting, uh, you know, the youth to also participate, which they did in from the village. But, you know, something sometimes, you know, the story takes a different turn on its own. So what happened was. I got a call from one of the villagers saying that um, my father also wants to register. Okay. I was like, okay, last minute registration. He's like, possible. I said, of course, possible. Give him a t shirt also for free. And uh, he didn't tell me how old he was. Okay, when the finishing and starting line, we are cutting the ribbon, I see this old man, 71 years old, and he's like, all oh, ready to run. Now, I was like, do we have oxygen cans? And like, <laughs> or do we have enough support up there? I was like, okay, one volunteer just assigned to him because. I know he also drinks. Okay, but uh, 
when I go to the finishing line, okay, I realize that it's finished faster than 50% of the runners. And he promised his family he would not drink. He did not drink that way. And he came running across the finishing. He's 71 years old and he finished in a timing of that very difficult eco trail in about one and a half hours. That means if he participates in any of these masters tournament that happens around here, he'd be a podium finisher. Okay, all his poverty problem, all of it is solved because they have prize money of close to 50,000 1 lakh rupees. And he didn't, it is the first time it seems he ran. Rest of the time he's just out cutting, you know, fodder for the cows or carrying the firewood from the forest and coming down. So, yeah, so that was extremely heartening to kind of realize and uh, see that something like this is possible. So now we are focusing on uh, livelihood generation and creating, uh, curating some of these events in the village because uh, anyone who is working in the sector, if you think that just solving the waste problem would solve people's problem, no. People will uh, come back and ask you, what next? Okay, so that's something for us to uh, absolutely consider. And uh, we also realize that uh, uh, anyone who is working on, like I said, the waste sector also has to be uh, balanced with work on the gardens because it will drive you mad, especially some people who are hands on and people who are part of your team. We may be sitting in an office, you know, directing, sending emails, sending, making the spreadsheets and saying, okay, the waste worker should, should, should do this or should do that. But we'll have to be absolutely cognizant of the fact that it's extremely difficult. They need additional support of the mental well-being. Now this also, uh, you know, I happened to kind of uh, realize this when I was having a conversation with uh, a fellow uh, entrepreneur in Kathmandu. So when Nat Geo uh, did this documentary and then we went to kind of watch this documentary uh, being screened um, in Kathmandu and there were uh, like there are 18 uh, organizations uh, featured. And in that, there's this organization doing extremely wonderful work in uh, Nepal. They're called Doko Recyclers. And they um, have uh, been taking, mostly focused on the B2B, but they've been taking the waste, working on it, and they've gotten the machinery to be able to process all kinds of waste. And uh, I was happy, to, uh, hap uh, I happened to talk to the founder and I was telling them that I'll send some of my team members there so that they can also go through an internship with Doko Recyclers so that we can also learn with them. And he kept listening, he kept listening, he kept listening. And I just, uh, and before that, we had talked about what we do also as TD. And he said, um, you know what? It's not that your workers need to come here. We need to go there. Okay, you have the forest, we don't. And actually hit me hard, you know, probably we are able to do what we're doing right now because we've got the forest. And it balances out. So it's extremely important. That's why I think for us to be able to somehow connect the waste management thing and realize how we can continue to uh, take Mother Nature's help to heal uh, people working in the sector and also uh, take Mother Nature's help to, uh, you know, shake people out of their consumerist mindset to realize you don't need that much because the more um, like I was uh, reading the line the other day that said only sustainable growth is degrowth right? so we need to really cut down on what we do okay so with that uh, I'm coming to uh, the end of uh, this particular uh, presentation and uh, also uh, with um, a, a sort of like a uh, invitation for all of you okay to come join us you may join us as a volunteer or we have uh, job opportunities also for people who are from the permaculture background okay and come be part of this uh, zero waste andalan okay and um, like i said someone said we've got the forest with us okay. so thank you very much it was wonderful being here thank you Narsanasa. thank you Sneha. Okay.